Hello everyone and welcome to the video. Today we are diving into our next unit. Um, it's all going to be focusing on this really important molecule that we've talked about before, DNA. Um, and today we're specifically going to be focusing on the history surrounding DNA and its structure. Those are going to be the first two main things we talk about today. Um, before we dive into kind of the, the nuts and bolts of DNA, how it's made and how it fits it together, I think it's important to give you some historical context. Think about some really important scientists um, who, who played a role in discovering kind of the, the importance of DNA and how it gets put together. So for a long time, science did not know the structure or much else about DNA. We were able to learn some things about it. Um, we, we figured out kind of the, the chemicals that it was made up of and the building blocks of DNA. But a really big mystery to scientists is the, the structure of DNA. How does it kind of fit together? And we, we got a breakthrough. So in 1952, a woman named Rosalind Franklin used the process of X-ray crystallography to take pictures of DNA. Um, so this is actually a picture of Rosalind Franklin over here. Um, and this is the picture that she's most well known for. This is called Photo 51 because that just happens to be the name of this photo, the, the order in which the photos were taken. And this photo was instrumental. It was really, really important for scientists to figure out ex the exact structure of DNA. Um, this, this was used to inspire a lot of really important work. And eventually, Rosalind Franklin herself was able to use this picture to kind of prove that there was a definitive structure of DNA that we could now know because of this picture. So, so Rosalind Franklin was super important in this process. However, some other scientists named Watson and Crick used Franklin's research to propose a theory for the double helix structure of DNA. Um, and this is a picture of Watson and Crick down here. And this is a, a pretty popular picture showing off their model that they created to show their proposed kind of structure for DNA and what we call this double helix shape. And we'll talk about this in a little bit. Um, but Eventually, Watson and Crick, their, their theory was accepted and it was widely acclaimed. People thought these, these two were, were really smart, and they are. They, they were really smart people, Watson and Crick. However, their work would not have been possible without the work of Rosalind Franklin. And I, I wanted to make sure that we, we focus on the, the importance of Rosalind Franklin's research. So Watson and Crick are credited for discovering the structure of DNA, but they would not have been able to confirm their theories without the work of Rosalind Franklin. So Watson and Crick went on to win the Nobel Prize for discovering the structure of DNA. Um, but a, a real unsung hero of this story is Rosalind Franklin. She, she really doesn't get the, the credit that she deserves. Um, and I, I wrote up a little blurb on her. Here. So because of her research, Franklin is arguably one of the most important scientists of all time and is not given the credit that she deserves. She would have likely received more credit for her research, but she died at age 37 from cancer, likely due to her extensive work with x-rays. So this is all just to say that even though Watson and Crick did get the Nobel Prize and were credited with discovering the structure of DNA, their theory would not have been able to be proven possible without Rosalind Franklin's work. Um, and, and I think that Rosalind Franklin is by far one of the most important women scientists, if not one of the most important scientists of all time, because of her work on DNA and what it allowed scientists to do in the future. All right, so now that we have a little bit of the historical background of DNA, let's dive into the structure of this complex molecule. So for the structure of DNA, the first thing we want to talk about is what does DNA actually stand for? So when we think about the abbreviation of DNA, it stands for deoxyribonucleic acid. So, so that's a really big, long name, but this is the, the name that scientists came up with because it describes the parts of the molecule that go up into making the building blocks of DNA. So again, deoxyribonucleic acid. I underlined the letters that make up this acronym. So D for the D and deoxy, ribo, and then N, nucleic, A, acid, deoxyribonucleic acid. So as this name implies, we, we talked earlier in the year about the, the main macromolecules, the kind of molecules of life, if you will, and DNA is a nucleic acid. And we want to remember that the monomers of nucleic acids are nucleotides. Um, and this is actually an example nucleotide down here. So nucleotides are going to be made up of three main groups. They're going to have a sugar group, 
phosphate group and a nitrogenous base. When we have this word nitrogenous, that just means that that group contains nitrogen. And nitrogen is a special element that we find in nucleic acids and proteins, and it's represented by this letter N here in our chemical structure. So nitrogenous means that this uh, part of the molecule has nitrogen in it. Um, and when we think about the building blocks of DNA, DNA is only going to have four types of nitrogenous bases. So even though DNA is a super huge, super complex molecule, it only has more or less four letters in its alphabet. If you will. And that's going to be adenine, thymine, guanine, and cytosine. And we're going to become much more familiar with these four nitrogenous bases, and we'll talk about how they kind of relate to each other in just a little bit. These are the four major nitrogenous bases that make up DNA. We kind of see that in this picture here. Um, I mentioned on the last slide the double helix shape. I'll, I'll dive into that a little bit again on the next slide, but this is going to be a relatively accurate model of what DNA would look like if we could kind of simplify it and look at it under a microscope. This is going to be the generalized shape that it holds. And when we talk about these bases, the bases are going to be the parts in the middle here that make up um, this middle part of the DNA molecule. We'll dive into more of the structure. So continuing to talk a little bit more about the structure, there's a few more parts of this complex molecule that we want to talk about. So when we hear um, the structure of DNA talked about, the word that we often hear is double helix. And this is basically a fancy way of saying that it's going to be two strands of DNA that are twisted around each other. Um, and when we have a molecule that is in a double helix shape, it's going to give the kind of appearance of almost a spiral staircase. Um, or if you untwist it, it kind of looks like a ladder. There's lots of different analogies that people use when talking about this complex structure of DNA. Um, one that is kind of easy to see, hopefully, in this picture is that if you were to untwist DNA and kind of have it all in one plane, DNA kind of looks like a ladder. And this is going to be a helpful analogy for us to think about how the parts of our DNA building blocks, our nucleotides, fit together. As we remember, our nucleotides are made up of three parts. We have our sugar, our phosphate, and our nitrogenous base. We're going to break down in just a second how they come together to form DNA. So the sugar and phosphate, they're going to form what's almost called a backbone. You also, you'll often hear the sugar phosphate backbone when we're talking about DNA. And that's referring to the sides of our ladder here, sticking with that analogy. So these pentagon shapes, those are our sugar groups. And this green P with the circle here, that is going to be our phosphate group. So you have a sugar phosphate, sugar phosphate, sugar phosphate, and then you have the same on the other side, sugar phosphate, sugar phosphate, sugar phosphate. Um, and that is kind of making up our backbone. This is going to be a nice sturdy structure that DNA is built upon. These bonds are never going to be broken along the edges here. Our sugar is almost always going to stay very closely tied to our phosphate groups here. It's going to be a very strong connection. The insides of our kind of structure here is, are going to be our nitrogenous bases. Our, our more fun colored boxes on the inside here are our nitrogenous bases. And hopefully you recognize these letters here. So we, we talked about the four names of our nitrogenous bases of DNA um, as being adenine, thymine, guanine, and cytosine. And that matches up with those letters, A, T, G, and C. Um, so we're, we're going to talk a bit more about how those all kind of fit together. So the strands are held together by hydrogen bonds. Hydrogen bonds are a special kind of bond. Um, and they're represented by these, these small lines in between our bases here. So the strands kind of get connected at the nitrogenous bases. So if we wanted to, we can pretty easily break these lines, and then we would have two st separate strands of DNA, one on the left, one on the right. Um, hydrogen bonds are nice because they're strong enough to hold the strands together most of the time, but they can be broken relatively easily. We're going to talk about cases why we would want to break apart these hydrogen bonds, um, but more or less, it's because we want to access the information that's contained within these um, nitrogenous bases. We're going to break these hydrogen bonds so that we have access to these nitrogenous bases on the inside. And one last thing that we're going to introduce in this video is an idea called Shargoff's Rule. Um, Shargoff was a researcher that um, looked at the DNA of lots of different living organisms. And basically what he discovered is that there is a rule 
for the ratios of these nitrogenous bases that are present in DNA. I want you to take a second and, and look here and see if you see a pattern as to what types of nitrogenous bases can bind with each other, just based on this picture here. What we may notice is that we see kind of a, a common thing here. If we were to continue the strand, we would see this theme continued. But what Shargoff was able to conclude with his research is that the adenine is always going to pair with a thymine. We're always going to have A bind to T. And we're always going to have our guanine, G, pair with C, cytosine. So due to his research, we were able to conclude, and Watson and Crick used this to inform their research as well, but what they were able to do is to determine that whenever we have DNA forming, we're always going to have G's bound to C's and T's bound to A's. This is a rule that will, will never be broken in DNA. Um, and it's something that's going to be really important going forward as we start to think about how we can make more DNA and how we can use DNA to, to basically be our instruction book for life. But that is what we are going to be diving into next time. So thank you all for watching.